that, I hand over directly back to Zoltan, who if you like all met earlier, so he needs no further introduction, and he's going to introduce his next guest for another exciting onstage conversation. Please welcome Zoltan again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> all right. So. Uh... Uh, brief introduction. Uh, so first, my, my name is Zoltan Vardy. I'm a startup mentor and, a, and the founder of a business development advisory called The Launch Code. And I'm chatting today with uh, Razvan Roman, who is a startup founder and investor uh, who has made the journey that so many young entrepreneurs uh, dream about. Um, having launched a business uh, first as a teenager, uh, Razvan's breakthrough came through uh, as co-founder of a company called TwoTap, uh, a platform that allows publishers to sell products directly in their apps. Um, he and his fellow Romanian-born co-founder uh, launched the company in 2014 and over the five years that followed, uh, built and ultimately exited the business through a trade sale to a large e-commerce player called Honey. Um, along the way, Razvan uh, moved from Bucharest to London, then London to Silicon Valley, uh, where he joined the 2014 winter cohort of Y Combinator the uh, globally successful uh, incubator program. Um, they together raised $4.5 million from uh, mostly US VCs and built 2Tap into a business that ultimately had about, uh, at its exit, about $100 million in gross merchandising volume and customers, uh, 50 customers from around the world, some of them publicly listed, uh, some of them high growth startups. Um, currently, Razvan splits his time between Miami and San Francisco and um, he's an active, angel investor through both uh, VCs and through his direct investments in over 20 plus companies, uh, including companies in the health tech, sleep tech, and ed tech area, and we'll be talking about those today. So we're gonna take uh, a journey together, Razvan, uh, from uh, the multiple levels from Europe to US, um, from entrepreneur to investor, um, and from startup to exit. So welcome on the stage of Techsylvania. Thank you, Zoltan. That's Absolutely. actually quite the comprehensive uh, <laughs> intro. Thank you. For well, I wanted to make sure everybody gets the proper context for our conversation. I feel like that's it. I should go on stage. <laughs> it's like, that's the whole story. <laughs> well, let's jump right in the middle. Um, the move to the US. Was that something that always was part of your grand vision for your life and for your business career? Or is that something that was more opportunistic because you had a chance to participate in Wine Combinator? Well, that's a good question. It was actually planned all along. Um, ever since I was very young and I started learning about startups, the, which was when I was about 13, 14 years old, um, I always realized that to build a, a, a very successful startup, to give it all, all you can, all its chances, at least in the uh, mid-2000s, you had to be in the US, you had to be in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. And so I planned very early on that I wanted to get there. I realized I had uh, quite the disadvantage compared to someone uh, born in the US, right, that had those chances, that um, had an easier way into that, that, that world. Um, but I always thought that if it takes me about five years to get there, um, it's probably worth it because those five years are going to pass anyway. And so I'd rather have those years pass and at the end of that process, I would be in the US and, you know, I would have the, the I would give the best chances, let's say, to, oh. my, to my venture. And, so, and you mentioned you wouldn't have the same advantages as an entrepreneur in the U.S. What, can you talk about that a little bit? What, what disadvantages well, would a European entrepreneur have or what advantages sure. does an American entrepreneur have? Well, I think it, it was a, a sort of a simplistic view, right? I was 13, 14 when I was, when I was thinking like this, <laughs> right? So okay. um, uh, from uh, just not being able to go to an Ivy League school, right? Uh -huh. Or uh, not speaking English as my uh, um, uh, main language, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to just cultural differences, right? That felt like uh, it was something that would have held me back and that I needed to spend some time in the U.S. to really kind of um, sink into the local culture and, and, and be able to produce value in that, in that system, which was somewhat uh, foreign to me, right, as, as a Romanian. So let's go back to that first month in Silicon Valley. Right. What do you remember about that time? Well, pretty much everything. <laughs> it, was, it was a very instrumental time. It was very important for me. So I was living in the UK. I had some savings. Uh, my co-founder and I, we applied to Y Combinator. Uh, it must have been like the seventh time between the both of us that we applied to YC. Really? Yeah, I, I first applied in the second batch of YC in 2007 to the accelerator. They were still in Cambridge then. 
you know, um, Stripe had applied in that, in that uh, batch and Sam Altman and, um, you know, there are very few people then. So I had uh, a very good way of finding the signal, even though YC was very, very early on. But, uh, Skip, you know, eight years later to 2013, when, when we applied, uh, they invited us to the interview. Uh, we had some savings, you know, we rented a car, we paid for an Airbnb for one month, and we said, okay, apart from the interview at YC, we really have to um, uh, make the best of this time to meet with prospective clients, to understand the local culture, to see if our company actually makes sense. Um, and so that's what we did for the whole month. Um, YC did not accept us in the batch. We were so sure we were going to get in. The interview went really, really well, but we didn't get in. Um, and so we decided to continue working on the, on the company because the meetings that we had with, with the prospective clients there went really well. And we managed to find uh, a prospective client that actually wanted to invest in us. He was a founder. He didn't have a lot of money. But he said, I really believe in your, in your business. I wanted to uh, start a similar business. And uh, he actually wrote us a check. And then six months later, we got into YC. But that, that first month, going back to your question, um, solidified the idea that we want to build this company in the U.S. Uh -huh. What in advantages did you have um, building the company in the U.S. versus, let's say, Europe? Obviously, we're in a room full of mostly European entrepreneurs. So how, many how, would thoughts you, on that. how would you see uh, so the difference? So many thoughts on that. So um, Europe was very difficult to handle because uh, things were moving very slowly. It depended on your education. It depended on your background. It depended on who else believed in you, who else could introduce you. Whereas what we found in the US was that we could uh, send a cold email today, maybe a follow-up tomorrow if we didn't get a response. We would have a meeting within 48 hours. They would uh, test our technology during the meeting or within the next 48 hours because time is money and if this <laughs> technology works, you know, it, it's very instrumental to my client as well. Um, and then if everything worked, we would have uh, uh, some planning with regards to going live with them, uh, a roadmap within a week of, uh, of, of uh, first contact. And it didn't matter who we were, it didn't matter what our background was, it mattered whether our technology worked or not and if it produced um, results or not for our clients. And that was uh, the night and day difference between Europe and, and the US, so. So speed is one. Speed, openness. openness to new ideas, correct. new technologies. Uh, was there anything about your background coming from Europe that was an advantage versus, let's say, others who maybe didn't have that background? There was. I think people, um, people still judge you, right, when they, when they meet you. And during those first interactions, they have to judge you. They have to form an opinion of who you are. But the fact that I didn't go to an Ivy League school, the fact that I didn't have those um, common denominators between myself and the, the, the person next to me, in front of me, meant that they had to really pay attention and, and, and understand who I am and where I'm coming from. And then, especially in the U.S., because of the speed, because of the, everyone wants to make very quick decisions, um, they also want additional data points, right? So they meet you the first time, they understand your background, but then when they meet you the second time around, especially when you're new in the U.S., they can see some progress. They can see some progress with regards to how you present yourself, how well you're just accustomed to the local culture. And they've seen it in other people as well. And so if you make very quick progress, even though the first time around when they first meet you, you might not seem very natural in the US, um, people understand that your trajectory, your vector is mm -hmm. really what's important. And so not having that background, not, not, not having something to rely on when they judge you, I think can be an advantage if you're a quick learner. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, obviously in retrospect, things often are much clearer. Uh, what would you tell the European founders here in the audience who want to build a business in the U.S.? How can they prepare for that uh, experience, maybe in a slightly better way than you were able to prepare? Well, I think the main, the main uh, that's a very good question, and you know, we could talk about this forever, but um, I think the, the main challenge that I see um, European founders um, 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 encounter when they move to the U.S., when they attempt to move, is that... Um, they're not really very open to feedback, and they're not really open to understanding a new system. The U.S. is a new system, and the fact that you know the European system, whether it's uh, European uh, in general or your country in Europe and how it, it operates, the U.S. is a different beast. And you have to find very quickly the, the, the sort of people that can give you um, the, the right advice. And mm -hmm. then you have to trust those people. And a lot of that advice will be counterintuitive 
to what you've learned and what you find natural coming from Europe. Could you give an example? Um, that's, a, that's a tough one, but um, an example about, um, about this. Hmm. Well, I, I've often talked to founders from Europe who've entered the U.S. market and they say that to this point about feedback is that you actually get a lot of very clear feedback from U.S. customers, from U.S. investors. There's not this, uh, you know, tiptoeing around the issue. You're like, yeah. well, look, your product sucks. Yeah, very straight you got to do this and this and this. Correct. Come back to me when you've, you know, addressed these problems, um, which can be uh, a double-edged sword, right? It can be refreshing, but it can also be scary. Correct. Um, how did you handle that feedback loop when you were launching and building 2Tap? Oh, that was very easy. Uh, we never had a chance. We never had a fallback. We never had a backup. We had to make things work. Mm -hmm. And so whatever feedback you get, you get through it very quickly, you adapt, you implement that feedback, you move forward, you get feedback again the next day. Uh, uh -huh. It really helped us that we didn't, have, we didn't have a visa, we didn't have funding to begin with, uh, we didn't have any clients, and so we were going all out. Um, and that, that, I think that really helped. Yeah. There was no plan B. There was no plan B, ever. <laughs> yeah. And you have to adapt very quickly, so if, you're, if your company, if your uh, project doesn't work to begin with, you have to adapt very quickly, and right. we were good at that. And uh, that's maybe one example to your question earlier. You know, uh, people sometimes stick too, too much to their original idea. You have to uh, be able to be flexible, but you also have to make the, the right decisions on when you need to stick to your guns and when you need to listen to, uh, to someone else. It's more of an art, I would say, but uh, maybe that sounds pretentious, but you need to surround yourself with people that you, you trust their advice, and then you need to really trust their advice. Yeah. So interesting, two things that you've talked about uh, to me um, actually support, for those of you who saw my presentation earlier about what the secrets of, of successful entrepreneurs, persistence, right? You applied to YC seven times. Focus. And agility, yeah. uh, which is about, you know, kind of constantly adapting to the situation Correct. and solving problems. So uh, hopefully we'll get to focus uh, soon as well. Well, when it comes to focus, just a short comment. Uh, Vlad, whom I've known for about 12 years, has been inviting me to Techsylvania um, during the time I was building 2DAP, and I had to say no every single time because we were heads down building the, the, the company. So focus is extremely important. Excellent. Correct. So let's move to the story of 2TAP. Um, what problem did you set out to solve with, with 2TAP? In 2013, um, mobile traffic was taking off. About half the traffic um, going to merchant websites was actually on uh, mobile phones, but the conversion rates were abysmal. No one would actually buy on their iPhone or their Android. It was very difficult to fill out the forms, etc. So we um, had built a technology that allowed um, uh, for quick checkouts on merchant websites. And you could do these checkouts. It was an e-commerce API. Um, you know, you would send us the, the shipping, billing, and transaction data. Our API would then automate placing an order on the merchant website and then send an order confirmation email back to the customer. So it was all automatic, it's very easy to handle, and um, uh, we had produced this, this, this uh, solution as a way to improve um, uh, conversion rates on, on mobile phones, which again was about 50% of traffic back then. Oh. How much did you have to iterate your solution to find product market fit? Maybe two, three times. Initially, we wanted to monetize um, 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 mobile banner ads, right? You had these banner ads that were very static, just an ad for something, you clicked on it, you ended up on the merchant website, no one was buying, right? Mm -hmm. So we said, well, instead of those ads, why don't we try to sell a product in the ad? You click on it and then you have the checkout form and that should uh, produce more money than your traditional CPM, right? Um, that didn't really work out mm -hmm. for a number of reasons, mainly because customers didn't really have the intent to buy something from a banner ad that they just saw for the first time, right? So that didn't work. And then we um, pivoted to talking to publishers, to companies, affiliates, uh, companies that had um, a huge number of eyeballs, a huge number of, of people on their uh, product, interacting with products, but then uh, those products were maybe reviewed or recommended. Imagine Pinterest, right? Pinterest is probably the best example. You see something on Pinterest, you want to buy it, but then you go to the merchant website, it's kind of difficult, you quit, you never actually end up buying the product, right? So what our technology could do was allow you to buy the product directly within the Pinterest app without leaving it, right? You would click on it, add to cart, and then finalize the checkout without going uh, to the merchant website then and there. Mm -hmm. And this was transformational for, for mobile. So we started uh, doing the rounds, talking to people, uh, talking to uh, publishers and offering the solution. 
and everyone was uh, was very very happy to hear that this exists. So you know, we actually our biggest our main challenge was the fact that we had maybe a few hundred clients in the world, right? They were very sizable clients, and as soon as they heard that this company uh, this technology existed, they wanted to purchase the company. Their mm -hmm. instant thought was that this is a really good idea. My business could really use this. This could be transformational. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid my, co my competitors will use it as well. So the way to do it is, is to not become a client of theirs, but try to buy the company. Okay, well, I guess there are worse problems to have than having people knocking on your door. It was quite a big problem, to be honest. But yes, it was, I mean, we, we were receiving these, these uh, acquisition offers, which were very flattering, right? We were maybe, during YC, maybe slightly earlier, people were saying, well, we can buy your company. You'll have a visa in the US, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they were starting, uh, the slow at the at the at the, <laughs> at the very low uh, low bar, right? When it comes to the acquisition cost. Yeah, like you but, get a visa and two tickets to the Lakers game. Right, or something, pretty right? much. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And we're like, wow, yay, geez, um, that's amazing. But could you use our product and you know pay an invoice for it? And they're like, okay. no, we'll see how you do. We'll talk again in a month. So that was pretty difficult. But then it became more flattering. Like Pinterest wanted to buy us, and then you know other companies as well. Very early on, right? But then as soon as we heard that we've heard it before, we knew that we didn't want to sell. And it was just, oh, you know, how do we get past this, this uh, initial reaction, right? How do we actually get them yeah. to pay and implement our, our technology? So. so we'll get to your exit. Um, but before we do, I do want to ask you to talk a little bit about your experience at Y Combinator. Um, sure. That happens to be one of these real um, uh, lighthouses, right, in this in the startup world. Um, it's it sure an opportunity does. for international companies to actually enter the U.S. through that program. Right. How did YC contribute to your success? And what would you tell uh, interested entrepreneurs, uh, what do they need to do to get into that program? Well, apply to YC. Um, you have to. It's, it's, it's one of the best programs out there. Um, uh, take the feedback that they give you. Um, think about it. Don't take it personally. Iterate on your, on your company and your product. Uh, you know, build another product, but get to YC. You want to be part of that, that group of people. Um, and it's not just for the mentors, but it's for your peer group. Um, uh, in my batch, we had, you know, Flexport, which is a huge company these days. A cruise Automation, right? Um, Self-driving cars. We had Algolia. Um, and all of these people, when, when we were in the program, we were all at the same level, all stressed out. It's this feeling of camaraderie that you spend three months there. It's all impossible. Investors don't like you. Your, your company isn't working. You're going to be on a stage in, in a few weeks. Um, and so uh, the bonds that you, and the relationships that you form there are just amazing and instrumental. And, um, you know, we, we're all friends, right? We, we kept in touch and we have, um, uh, we have this instant bond when we meet a, a fellow YC uh, founder that has been through the program. When I, were, uh, when I was going through the program, uh, Sam Altman was uh, transitioning to being the president of the, of the um, um, program. And him and Gary Tan were my direct partners. Um, and uh, PG, uh, Paul Graham, was still leading the, the, the program, but that was his last batch. He actually left the program. So um, it, was, um, it was a sort of a golden era, as it were, because a lot of things were happening, but the old guard was, was still there. And the program has evolved a lot. It's now, um, you, you now have more resources uh, about getting into YC, and uh, the program is a lot more global, and you have a lot of support. I've so. heard about a third of the uh, batches are international. Uh, probably, I, I wouldn't know the Which statistics, probably was not but the case back in I would assume probably a bit more. Actually, maybe mm -hmm. half or more is mm -hmm. now international. Mm -hmm. um, our batch was actually the first batch the YC kind of um, 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 decided that they want to try out more international founders. Worked out really well, and they've they've doubled down on it. So. Okay, let's get to your fundraising journey. So one of the things we talked about uh, yesterday when we first met was you actually didn't raise that much money. You raised four Correct. and a half million dollars. Yes. Um, before you exited, right. um, what were your learnings from that process? Uh, you know, your first seed stage, and then ultimately what led to your exit. Well, I think it's a really important point. Uh, you have to be very realistic when you're building your company. You don't want to raise too much money too early on. You have to make sure that you have product market fit. You have to make sure that you can return that money. Otherwise, you will not make any money if you end up selling your company, or you will have a cap table that is going to uh, come back and, and bite you later on. 
uh, as you're building the company. So uh, you want to not sell too much of your company, but you want to give yourself the, the, the proper chances. I would say we had um, maybe two, three times um, the amount of money that we raised on the table offered to us, and we just say no to it because we realized this wasn't because this wasn't happening because our company needed the money. It was because investors had a lot of money and they wanted to put it into something. Mm -hmm. uh, but we realized it was a mistake to raise that much money early on. Um, it would have shut down a lot of doors for us. And uh, that actually ended up being true. And uh, um, that's why you had a successful exit. Uh, mm -hmm. We were always focused on uh, making the company profitable and um, not, you know, not playing the, the, the popularity games or anything like that. So mm -hmm. we'd raise the money, we went back to work as soon as possible, and, and, and that was it. And you ended up selling to a company that you had a business relationship with. We had a business relationship with them, correct. This was a company called Honey. Uh, they started around the same time as us, and uh, uh, the founders were really great. We were friends with them. They had a really difficult time in the early days um, with regards to raising money. Uh, or getting into YC, or even getting um, uh, investor meetings. And um, uh, we tried to guide them through that. We were the successful ones, right, mm -hmm. in, the, in the group, because we had raised money, we had been through YC. And uh, we integrated our, our uh, technologies together. They had a, um, um, a Chrome extension that saved you money whenever you were buying something. And with, with TwoTab, you could actually buy from the Chrome extension very quickly, right? You could do a, a quick checkout. And uh, as, uh, you know, as it happens, it, as uh, unpredictable as uh, fate is, three years later, Honey really took off. So uh, they were doing a huge amount of revenue, incredibly profitable. Um, and um, six years later, we still had this vision of integrating the two technologies uh, to, um, to build a really good product, a really good experience. And uh, they made an offer that we couldn't refuse, and we had some fatigue, um, you know, after six years of building the company. Uh, during which we always try to build this billion dollar project to get more independence um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in, our, in our sales, uh, which was very difficult. Um, and uh, we ended up selling, so. Okay, so we've only got two minutes left. We've talked about your um, journey from uh, Europe to US. We've talked about your journey from startup to exit. Let's talk about your journey from entrepreneur to investor which is your current sure. uh, focus. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, you have 20 plus direct investments. Um, you're also a limited partner in several VCs. Uh, do you have an investment focus um, that you, or a thesis that you follow in your, in your investing decisions currently? I do not, no. I, um, I tend to look at the founder. I like to invest uh, early stage. Um, I've done some growth rounds. Uh, but I see that as a different uh, proposition altogether. You know, the company has product market fit, they're growing. Uh, but when you're looking at early stage, you're looking at the founder, you're looking at their uh, uh, approach. Um, and that's, that's really it. The, 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 the project itself can be in any domain, mm -hmm. as long as I, I do my due diligence and try to understand it. But I don't have a thesis, per se. Um, I would say um, I invest in what I like. I don't necessarily invest in things that make... Um, that only make money, I like to invest in, in companies that have a mission mm -hmm. because that makes me love them more. It makes me more attracted to the company and, and mm -hmm. try to help the company. Um, so, you know, I've invested in 8sleep, which is a, a smart uh, sleep cover, right, that mm -hmm. um, regulates your, uh, your uh, temperature as you sleep, uh, or in Levels, which is a continuous glucose monitor. So these are products that I actually use personally, and uh, I think they're, they're, they're really instrumental in, in, in what they do. They, they change human behavior. Um, and I think that's important. It's important to love the company that you invest in. Uh, okay. But um, I've had offers of becoming a, an institutional investor and raising funds and everything, and I've declined that because I didn't want to invest other people's money to begin with. I wanted to see if I'm good at it or not to begin with, and um, yeah, that's, that's, that's where I am. Okay, fantastic. So unfortunately, we've run out of time, um, but as a closing thought, Really quickly, top three pieces of advice for your immediate entrepreneurs who want to build a business in the U.S. What are well, the things? Number one, uh, stop me on the hallway and ask me anything. I'm an open book. Uh, <laughs> number two, do not quit. Number three, do not be discouraged, which is probably similar to number two. You have to apply. You have to go there, and you have to have an open heart. You have to forget a lot of the things that, and the hardships that you've been through here. You have to understand that it's a, uh, it's a, it's a new chapter in your life, and you have to be open to that. Um, and uh, I've seen the, the, uh, countless uh, European founders be very, very successful when, uh, when they have that approach when they move to the U.S. Okay. So uh, all, all positive and, and very optimistic thoughts from, uh, from my point of view. 
Thank you on an optimistic note. Thank you very much, Thank you, for your uh, contribution. Really and uh, for anybody who wants to get a little bit more deep insight into uh, the, the journey that uh, Razvan has had on these different planes. Happy to chat. I'm not doing uh, a Q&A on the, on the separate scene, but um, you, know, you, can, uh, you can stop me and uh, happy to chat about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Zoltan, Roman, thank you so, so much. Great discussion. Really appreciate it.